Welcome to my homestead, y'all. I'm your host, Jenny Veliki, also known as the Funky Farm Girl. I'm working to create a home with a little farm, a little faith, a lot of food, and a bit of funky. I'm learning all about growing and preserving our food supply, raising chickens and children, and becoming more self-sufficient while leaning hard on Jesus. And I want to take you along for the ride. So grab yourself a cup of something wonderful, and let's visit a while. Hey, y'all, this is Jenny Veliki. You're listening to The Funky Farm Girl, and this is episode 40. This is week three of the Chicken 101 series. This week, we're talking about hens and roos, so stay tuned. This week on the homestead, we are working the dehydrator. We are making deer jerky. Uh, We're drying out some mint and some herbs that I've had growing by the window, And I'm finally getting through the rest of those apples in the fridge and putting them through the dehydrator so that we have um, dried apples and jerky and herbs and leaves for tea that we can use throughout the year. Um, Now's a good time of year to be running a dehydrator because it does get a little bit warm and it also makes your house smell good depending on what you're dehydrating. So... Um, getting that done before the busy of spring hits and cleaning out some of the fridge and freezer um, to make room for the new harvest that we'll be preparing for soon. So let's get into today's episode on Chicken 101, Hens and Roos. So last the first week we talked about all the different things you needed as far as structures and equipment and food and water and all those kinds of things. Last week we went we were real deep into depth about how to choose the type of chicken that you want and then how to raise chicks. Um, then this week we're going to talk more about raising hens and roosters and things to think about. Um, as these chicks that you've bought grow older and bigger and begin laying eggs. So let's jump right in. So the first thing that you're going to want to do, you have chicks or you have hens and roosters that you um, have grown to the point that they're feathered out, they're ready to be outside, you put them in the coop you let them run around, they're scratching and pecking, and they're happy out there, and then you look at them and think, well, now what do I do? Um, One of the first things that you need to teach them is where home is, and the way you do that is you need to begin to train them of where to go at night, and you want to train them to go to sleep inside the coop on the roosting bars that run across the inside of the coop. Uh, Every coop is going to have a large area with bars across for roosting on and then they're also going to have smaller compartments or places on the side um, where chickens can lay eggs Uh, and those are nesting boxes and what you want to do is you want to encourage them to roost on the roosting bars and sleep there. They will tend to pile up together in a big wad and snuggle up to each other and to stay warm and to stay cozy and all sleep together. You want to discourage them from doing that in the nesting boxes simply because chickens who sleep are chickens who poop and if they're pooping in the nesting boxes and then they go back in there and lay an egg in the nesting box it's going to land in poop and you're going to have more to clean when it's time to bring those eggs inside. So For the time being, especially when you have young ones who don't even know what the nesting box is for, you might want to block it off with a piece of cardboard or a box that's upside down that they can't get into that space or something like that that prevents them from going in that area where you want them to lay and keeping it clean. And so they learn to sleep in the coop. So right about dusk, you're going to want to go out and put them in the coop for 
the first several weeks that we had chickens, I would go out there and I would pick them up and I would put them inside and I would get them all in there and make sure they were standing on the coop. If they went into the nesting box, I would nudge them back down to the coop floor to the roosting bars and then we would close up the coop at night and then first thing in the morning I'd go out there and open the door and let them out again. And after a couple weeks, they they got the drill and they would go in there all by themselves. Once they're going in there by themselves, especially if you live in a place, which I think most of you will, where you're going to have self-contained chickens who are in an enclosed run, um, then you don't really need to close the door at night. Um, You can go out and do that if you want to and open it in the morning, but... I find that it's really not very necessary once they know where to go because they will go in there at night and they will sleep and then they will come back out in the morning. Sometimes when it's really, really warm in the summer, they'll sleep outside on roosting bars inside the run, um, but outside of the coop. Um, But you want to make sure um, that they know that the coop is home. If you're going to be allowing them to free range, um, I suggest that you confine them to the coop and run for, for a period of time until they know that that's home. So that um, when you go to let them out, you let them out in the late afternoon for the first few times so that they're only out for an hour or so. And then you bring them back in right as it's starting to get a little bit less light in the sky. Uh, you don't want to wait till it's too late and you can't find them in the dark. Um, but just starting that routine again of leading them back to the coop when it's time and over time they will learn that that's where they go when it starts to get dark and they will automatically go from out in the yard to their coop at night to roost on their roosting bars so um once you have them trained on where to sleep uh, there are some other things that you need to worry about as far as what they need first of all they need shelter from wind and rain and again that's what their coop is for Um, but sometimes it's good to have even in their run that they have a place where they can be outside but it can be covered in such a way that they can be outside but not be wet or not be pounded by wind or things like that so we have um a cover on the top of a majority of our chicken run uh, we had a, a good size cloth covering over the top of one part of it um, and it has since ripped and we are in the process of putting up um, a corrugated like plastic type roof over the part of the chicken run so that they at least have a place that they can stand outside of the coop when it's rainy or something like that and they still want some fresh air. Um, we also have one of the coops is higher up and they can access underneath it and be under there so that they're out of the wind and the rain, but they also have a way to be outside and undercover. So um, besides that, there are some things that are practical that they're going to need inside the coop and run. One of the things is something for a dust bath. Chickens primarily use dust baths to um, keep mites and lice off their bodies and also to keep clean and cool. And so they will naturally want to dig and make holes and like nesting holes that they will snuggle down in. They will kick and dig through um, whatever it is that you have down for the bedding in their coop, uh, in their run. And um, so we try to keep... uh, an area where they have a container that has some either diatomaceous earth or um, wood ash or uh, we burn a lot of cardboard and things like that and so we'll take the ash from that and put it in a pile in there and they have that that they can dig around in and dust bathe in so that is something that they really need especially to help keep mites and lice away um, you also need um, chicken feed you're going to keep giving them the chick starter until they start laying and then you're going to give them layer pellets 
Um, I highly recommend layer pellets over the layer crumble because the crumble is going to cause a lot of waste. They're going to kick it around and toss it out and um, it's going to get on the ground and, and be lost where the pellets are a lot easier for them to still see it and grab it um, even if it does land on the ground. Um, that's going to be their primary source of food. And the reason being is because chicken feed has specific balances of protein and minerals and vitamins and things that are essential for chicken growth. And if you feed them anything else as their primary source, they're not going to be getting what they need. So even if you have chickens who primarily free range and get a lot of forage things outside, still offer them some chicken feed. They may not eat as much of it, but they are having the opportunity to get that and get the the vitamins and the nutrients and the protein from that that they need to still produce good eggs. Another thing that you can give them as a supplement is kitchen and garden scraps. Anything that you would put in a compost, you can basically give to the chickens. Uh, you can even take their eggshells and dry them out and give them back to them. Um, make sure that they're dry, that they don't taste like egg or you're going to have an issue. Um, because you don't want them to eat their own eggs. That can become a major problem. Um, but you can give them back their shells crushed and dried um, and they will peck through that. Um, I basically, if I'm cleaning up the garden and pulling different plants that are finished, I'll throw them in there. I may have um, a random couple pieces of, of produce that maybe had a bug or something in it that I will throw in there from the garden or even worms or caterpillars and things that I find I'll throw in there. Um, vegetable peelings all kinds of things like that um, there are a few things that they shouldn't have um, and I will put um, a link in the show notes for that so that you know what not to give your chickens but honestly the list is pretty short and the things that they can't have they are they're not attracted to so they don't tend to eat them anyway um, scratch and occasional treats um, chicken treats um, you go to the store you're going to see a lot of that because a lot of people now want pets chickens as pets and um, so they're going to market to them like they would a pet of another kind but remember treats are like candy and so we don't want to give them too much of them you wouldn't give your kids lots and lots of cookies even though they would really love them you know that they're not very good for them to eat lots of and so you would primarily want to give them fruits and vegetables so we need to think of that in terms of our chickens too we want to primarily give them their chicken feed that's balanced for their diet give them occasional supplements of things from our garden or our kitchen um, and the things that they forage if they're able to free range and then um, occasionally give them a little chicken treat of some kind or scratch um, and again you need to give them grit just like you would for baby chicks and the grit is more of a vitamin that's going to help them to um, produce the calcium that they need for strong shells and Another way to do that again is to feed them back the shells of their own eggs once they've been dried and crushed. Uh, you also want to make sure that they have clean and plentiful water. Um, dehydrated chickens who are deprived of water for even just a couple hours can affect the way they lay for weeks. So you want to make sure that they always have clean fresh water and that there's plenty of it. And if you live in a place where it, it gets cold, um, make sure that the water's not frozen. Um, we're lucky that where we live, we have fairly mild winters. Um, I think we've gotten down to around 20 this year has been about the lowest we've been. And honestly, as long as the, ch the chicken water is full enough, um, it's not cold enough to make it freeze completely. It may be cold enough we had one time that it was cold enough to freeze the water nipples um, and we had to put some hot water in them but that was just a one-time thing and for the most part um, I'm just out there making sure that the waters work properly and that they're full um, they also need places to roost um, because they need to be able to fly up and sit and come back down and things like that um, 
things that stimulate them, whether it's something to dig through or things like that. You want to really make sure that um, you have stuff like that um, that gives them a little bit of variety so that they don't get bored. Because um, if they're bored, they're going to start becoming aggressive with each other or they'll become lethargic and we don't really want that either. Um, they need nesting boxes um, in order to have somewhere to lay their eggs. It could just be a specific part of the coop that they use um, or it may be something that if you have them like for example in an old shed you may have to put something in, in there for them to use for a nesting box like a milk crate on its side with some um, straw in it or some um, pine shavings so they need somewhere to lay their eggs um, again they need socialization they need to interact with you so that if there's a problem with one of them they are used to you and you are there and the best way to catch those problems early is to spend time with your chickens and spend time with them early and often um, the more time you spend with them the happier they're going to be to see you they're going to expect that when you come out there they're bringing that you're bringing them something um, my daughter Georgia goes out there every morning and makes sure that they have the food and water they need and then there's a whole bunch of clover that grows right beside the chicken coop under the tree and she will pick some of that clover and throw it into the pen and everybody gets a little bit of clover in the morning so when she comes out they're excited to see her because they know Georgia brings us clover um, so just little things like that and then just kind of stand there and watch them for a little while and make sure that they're behaving normally make sure that there's nothing concerning um, that you need to look at or worry about um, and we'll talk about things like that here in just a minute um, and also you want to make sure that your coop is clean and that um, it's dry and that goes for the coop as well as the run um, and again just like with baby chicks keeping their area clean and dry is the best way to prevent any kind of sickness and things um let's see here if they are free range they're also going to need to be able to be safe from dangers and we're going to do that by one looking out for predators in the area um looking out for things like dogs who might live at neighbors houses and be loose or maybe they're close to traffic maybe there is a high population of hawks or um, things like that you don't want to leave them out overnight because there might be something like possum or raccoons that would get to your chickens and so um, be aware of what predators they may fall danger to um, be aware of things like dogs and traffic and things like that that might keep them from being safe and then be aware that they have places to hide or roost and this one right here um, actually a combination of all three is why we do not free range our chickens um, one our yard is a pretty big open area in the back and we don't really have a way to contain them to just our property um, we have neighbors behind us that have three dogs and their dogs are trained to stay in their yard but their dogs have not had chicken meat dangled in front of them to tempt them either so I don't want to begin that <laughs> um, and we also because we have big open areas um, and we're in the country we have a high population of hawks and not very many places that they could easily run to and hide or roost um, to get away from a predator and so for those reasons we do not free range but if you are going to free range you need to make sure that those things are in place now as I said before there are a couple things you need to watch for um, again this the same things that we mentioned last time they're not as common as the birds get older but you're going to want to watch for birds who are lit listless and lethargic um, birds who um, are panting with their mouths open um, bubbles on their nose things like that that may um, signal a cold or a virus that's going around that you want to separate that chicken 
and just give it some extra hydration and some rest and see if you can um, get the chicken to turn around and and begin to be a little more healthy um, another thing that we have to keep an eye on is bumblefoot and bumblefoot is basically a cyst that grows on the bottom of their foot where they've gotten um, something in their foot and it causes a big growth on the bottom of their foot and it's painful and swollen and basically that needs to be cut open with a razor blade and popped out and then it needs to be bandaged and taped up um, we've had that happen twice um, in the first couple months that we had chickens and then once we kind of figured out how to deal with it and everything and, and really worked on keeping their coop good and dry we've not had any more issues with that so those are just a few of the things that um, you need to keep an eye on um, as your chickens grow and mature so for egg layers um, when they get to about 18 to 20 weeks um, for Moran's it's going to be a little longer for for our hazel our little copper black copper Moran she was about 30 weeks old um, but at about 18 to 20 weeks old they're going to begin to lay eggs um, one way that you can tell that they are about to start laying is when you go out there and you go to pet your chicken um, if they stop and squat and spread they'll, they'll kind of square up their feet and squat down and spread out their wings and and it's almost like prepare to mount um, and literally that's what they're doing they're preparing for mating and that will give you the signal that those birds are ready to begin producing eggs very soon so when you see them begin to do that um, then you can begin looking for eggs it takes a hen 22 hours to produce an egg from start to finish um, and when they first begin they're gonna have some funky looking eggs you may have some that have lots of heavy deposits on them where there's bumps or things on the eggs where it's it's had extra calcium and so it's got little bumps and things that are raised up that are heavier calcium than others um, the bloom or the color of the egg um, may be varying um, we've had what we call ombre eggs where it's darker on one end um, and lighter on the other end and we kind of make a joke that their toner is low um, you can also have inconsistent size um, even what they call fairy eggs or a fart egg which is just a really small egg and some most times doesn't even have a yolk in it um, where they're either stressed or startled or um, they're just beginning and they don't know the full process yet and so sometimes they may have false start eggs that are smaller um, than the others and you may even have eggs that don't have a shell at all and um, those eggs are kind of funky to find um, especially if you're not expecting it and you go to grab it and you pop it in your hand um, make sure if you do that that you clean all that up out of there because one thing you don't want is for them to become egg eaters and that's why you're going to want to collect your eggs promptly um, we go out a couple times a day we go out first thing in the morning and say good morning to the chickens and feed and check their feed and water watch them for a little while Georgia feeds them some clover and she checks for eggs uh, and then about mid-afternoon we go out again and we say hello to everybody see how everybody's doing um, and check for eggs one more time um, don't want to leave eggs in there for very long because they will step on them they will peck them and once they get a taste of those eggs it's it's kind of like a dog who's killed something um, they get a taste for it and it's hard to train it out of them and so they will constantly peck eggs from then forward um, if you don't do something about it so that's something you really really want to watch for um, thankfully that's something that we have not had to deal with yet um, basically they're gonna lay on a pretty regular basis between two and three hundred eggs a year depending on the breed that you chose um, they will take a break in the winter 
um, because they need 12 hours of daylight in order to produce an egg. So when you get down below 12 hours of daylight, they're either going to peter out and stop altogether, or they may only give you like one a week or whatever. They may just suddenly stop. Um, it's really kind of unpredictable. Um, and then when the daylight hours begin to increase again, then they'll start. Um, they're also going to molt, um, at least once, sometimes twice a year in the spring and the fall. And typically when the chickens molt in the fall, by the time they're done molting, which can take a couple weeks for them to lose all their feathers and get new ones, um, during that time they really need extra protein. So they're going to be eating extra food, but they won't be laying eggs. And once the molt is completed, then they should start laying again, unless your daylight hours are too short. And then they may take a break until spring, have a molt, and then start again. Um we have had them restart without having a second molt so um it's it's kind of varies from breed to breed but um the experience is that they tend to molt at least once a year that they need the protein during that time so they don't lay and then once the molt is over they'll continue again or wait until the spring um for meat birds if you are ra raising birds for meat rather than for eggs, it's going to be a different experience. With egg layers, you're raising them from chicks and you're babying them and taking care of them. And then when they're old enough, you go and you put them out in the run and you teach them to sleep in the coop and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that with meat birds. With meat birds, you're going to have an area... Um, for them to be where they have access to food and water until they're big enough to be outside and then you're going to put them in what's called a chicken tractor which is basically a self-contained chicken run that moves from place to place and you're going to move that every 24 hours to a new spot in your yard um, there are two kinds of chickens that most people use for meat birds the most common is called cornish cross and these are the typical white chickens that you see that are used by commercial growers um, who process chickens for our consumption um, and is the cheapest and most economical bird to get um, you can begin to butcher those as soon as eight weeks um, but typically between three and four months um, as long as eight months but you really don't want to go past that or they're pretty tough um, so and typically Cornish cross are not going to live that long. Um, Cornish cross are going to be birds that grow very, very quickly and put on weight very, very quickly so that um, you have a bird that's big enough to butcher. Um, Freedom Rangers are a heritage breed um, who prefer to do foraging um, more than... Cornish cross, their whole job is to eat, and that's all they will do. As long as you have food in front of them, they will just gorge themselves on food and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and their genetics are made for them to just grow and grow very quickly. Freedom Rangers are going to want to forage a little bit more, so they may, may need a larger space um, in a chicken tractor. You may not want to be put as many of those in to one as you would the Cornish cross. Um, and they're also going to take longer. They're going to take um, a few more months than the Cornish cross will. Um, and they may be a bit of a leaner bird. Um, so really it's a preference. Um, they cost more because of the longer grow out time. Um, but those are the two basic kinds. Um when it's time to butcher the chickens, when they get to the time that you're going to butcher it, like I said, it's typically three to four months. Um, you can wait as long as eight months to grow them out a little bit bigger. But if you go eight months and longer, typically they're, the, the longer you go, the tougher their meat can be. Um, you can either pay a chicken processor or you can process it yourself. Um, if you're keeping it just for you it's just fine for you to just do it yourself um i have friends who have done this and um i'm waiting on their next batch for them to do i'm going to go and help them for a day and learn the process just because i love to learn new things so um 
if it's something that you're interested in doing there's lots on YouTube and things that show you exactly how um, or you can pay to have it done um, but typically uh, a butcher is going to charge you um, a certified processor will charge you about six dollars a bird and so you're really not going to make any money off of those um, it's much much more economical if you can do it yourself so a six pound bird is going to yield about four pounds of meat um, just to give you an idea of what you're looking at in terms of meat birds and we'll talk about um, raising birds for meat to sell next week when we talk about making money from our chickens um, egg layers are going to be um, laying eggs for about two to three years of just cranking out one egg right after another on a regular basis after about three years um, they tend to slow down and peter out and um, make fewer and fewer eggs eggs are like people in that the female birds have a specific number of eggs in their system and once they've used those eggs they will stop producing they won't make any more eggs to lay because they've used all the ones that their body was allocated um so um however they can still continue to live after they stop producing eggs just like us and so their life expectancy can be as long as eight ten years um so that's something that you have to think about ahead of time is what are you going to do with your older retired ladies who are done laying and who um are no longer producing for your farm anymore um another thing that you're going to need to think about is roosters what are you going to do with your gentlemen um are you going to rehome them sometimes there are certain local hatcheries that if you purchase your chicks from them they have a buyback guarantee for the roosters where they'll take them back um it may be that you need to find them a home it may be that you keep them and use them for breeding so that you have fertilized eggs to hatch and sell um, as chicks um, which is what we're doing with Fred um, and it may be that you decide that you keep one or two to protect your flock when they're free ranging and to just watch over your ladies and make sure that they're happy and give him a fun time but also um, that you don't have too many because you really only need one rooster for about every 10 hens um, so make sure that your ratios are right because if you have too many roosters um, one they're going to fight amongst each other and two they're going to wear your girls out and then your girls are going to be stressed and they're not going to lay as many eggs for you and so that's just going to be a problem for everybody all the way around so with your older hens and with your roosters you really need to have a plan in place as a responsible chicken owner what are you going to do when you have chickens who are sick chickens who are older and are no longer producing and roosters that you don't have a need for what are you going to do with those birds um, as a responsible chicken owner you need to have at least thought through what your process in making that decision is going to be um, just like you would for a cat or a dog or anything else that you keep as a pet um, you're definitely going to be wanting to make those decisions but even as a responsible homesteader um, the death of animals on our homesteads is an inevitable thing and sometimes there's animals that need to be culled and we need to know how to deal with those things when they come and we need to know what the decision is apart from the emotion that's attached to it so if it's something that we're thinking about ahead of time it's a lot easier to determine this is what's going to happen um, I've decided that for me I have a duty to my flock from birth to death it is my duty I'm not going to take all the fun parts of having chickens and cuddle the babies and take all the eggs and everything and then at the last minute chicken out for lack of a better term um, and leave it to someone else to end their life um, that chicken owes me nothing um, 
uh, that chicken has has given everything to me and the least I could do is show it some respect and some dignity in the end by taking responsibility for for its end of life um, if it comes to that so I want to make sure that you guys really think through that um, before you start down the road to chickens what are you going to do with that and again that's why I'm going to my friend's house to learn how to butcher these chickens one because I like to learn but two I know that inevitably at some point I'm going to have a chicken that's that's sick or I'm going to have um, a rooster that's really aggressive and nasty to my girls and I'm going to need to get rid of him because I'm not going to want to pass his problem off to somebody else um, I'm going to have a hen that's very old and no longer productive for me and I may need to cull her in order to make room for younger hens to come in who will produce eggs for me Um, and in all those situations I want to give that bird the dignity of the caregiver being the one who makes those decisions and carries them out and so uh, you may or may not disagree with me but um, that is where I've arrived at that decision and I think it's everybody's uh, responsibility as chicken owners to um, arrive at your own decisions on those things particularly if you can do it ahead of time without the emotion attached to it in the moment okay and with that we wrap up our episode on hens and roosters i hope these episodes have been informative for you i hope they've been helpful if there are specific things that you want to ask me feel free to go over to instagram facebook or pinterest Um, my name is the funky farm girl on all three and you can ask me any of your questions through the messages there um I would love for you to leave me a review. Every five-star review that I get bumps me further up the list of visibility to people searching for podcasts. So your review matters because the more eyes I get in front of, the more ears I can get into. So thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week when we will round out our series on Chicken 101 with how to make money from your flock. Thanks for stopping by, y'all. If you're inspired by what you've heard today, the best compliment you can give me is to share the Funky Farm Girl with your friends. You can stay connected by following the Funky Farm Girl on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Until we meet again next week, remember to bloom where you're planted.